Hello, everyone. I'm Amelia Sargent. I'm the Producing Artistic Director of Tampa Repertory Theater. And we are here with award-winning playwright, Lauren Gunderson. Uh, Lauren Gunderson has topped, our, topped the list of the most produced playwrights in our country for two years running. And um, I'm personally a big fan of her work. And uh, we also have here uh, our actors, Nicholas D. Hoop and Olivia Sargent, if we can have them come on to video to say hello. They'll be here in a minute. <laughs> so I had the pleasure of um, being able to, oh, there they are. So you guys can, uh, so they are on set <laughs> as we can see. Um, and also with us today, we have a special invitation uh, uh, for Generation Z artists in the area. Can you guys unmute your videos and wave so we can see who we're talking to? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody, okay, wonderful. So you can go ahead and hide your video and um, I'm gonna begin by, uh, first of all, congratulations actors, that was fabulous. Thank you so much for a, a wonderful live performance or theater performance in a video uh, atmosphere. It's new for everyone. Um, so Lauren, I, I'm gonna begin just by ask, asking you one question uh, to start us off. Um, what is sort of the, what is the Genesis story for I and You? I mean, it became um, a play about and with about a lot of things and with a lot of intentions. And the main thing being, I didn't see a lot of plays where young people were uh, centered uh, for main stage theater. You see, you have a lot of theater for young actor, young audiences and young actors and that kind of kids theater stuff. But there's so much um, to being a young person uh, and we all were, <laughs> and we still are a version of that young self that is, whatever life gets us and gives us and change how it, how it changes us. So I think a show about young people is a show about a lot of, is a show about everybody. Um, and especially in the, the way that this play can be about connection and commonality and empathy with people that you may not seem to have a lot in common with or rub you the wrong way at first, um, which I think that of course becomes more and more important as the years go on in this, <laughs> in this century. Um, so it, it becomes a play about a lot of things, but it's a play about beauty. It's a play about poetry. It's a play about art. It's a play about legacy and mortality and um, youth and hope and all the things that um, have been important to me since I was a young person myself. That's wonderful. All of those things are the very things that attracted me to producing and directing this piece. So I'm going to open up the, um, the floor for some questions um, using the hand raise function. Uh, so for my Gen Z panel, if you guys want to go ahead and ask um, a question, we'll have you unmute your video when it's your turn um, using the hand raise function or I can just actually call on you. That might be easier. So now that I'm seeing that this is <laughs> a little more challenging. So one second. The other thing I can, I can offer while you're- Yeah, thank you. Is, is, um, it's so interesting what this play has become since the lockdown. It, and uh, oddly it is a pandemic play when it wasn't intended to be, but it's a play about a girl who can't leave her house. Yeah. <laughs> it's about a girl who can't go to school, um, about sickness and about resilience and about fear of what's to come and the unknowingness of it, um, defiance in the face of death. And I mean, haven't we all had a lot of that in our lives in the last several months? So and it's been uh, hard to say a pleasure to see this play done in this time, but it has been... Um, uh, a balm in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, it's a play also about how, how she and he turn to forms of art um, in times of crisis and in times of concern and, and fear. And um, yeah, so it's, it's been a delight. I, I've seen a few readings of it. Um, Wonderful. And, 
one production. <laughs> I know that um, Olivia had a question about mm -hmm. the main character. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I was curious um, what inspired you to write about uh, a girl with chronic illness uh, because both of us read this play of like three years ago, um, but we haven't, we weren't able to produce it until now. And since then I've had my own experience with chronic illness, um, especially it, during the pandemic. So it, it seemed very fortuitous to be able to actually produce it at this time. So I was just curious um, of what inspired you to create a character who has to deal with illness and in her case, terminal illness. Yeah, great question and beautiful performances, both of you. you know, it's very impressive, um, especially with all of the constraints. <laughs> um, so bra brava, bravo. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what, when you write a play about illness, you're writing a play about mortality, which is something we'll all go through and know. Um, and so you're writing about one of the biggest things you can write about and one of the most curious things and fearful things. Um, and so in some ways, putting that pressure on these young people is a really interesting combination that I wanted to, to explore. And um, I wanted to find ways to limit her and to frankly make her furious at the world mm -hmm. and furious at fate and God and whatever she believes in. She is, um, I'm sure de depression is part of it, but she is scared and angry and doesn't want anything to do with the world, doesn't trust it, doesn't care about it. Um, and so what a bigger struggle for Anthony, who is like, oh, you have to care about the world. <laughs> you really, really have to, because I can't anymore. Of course, we don't know exactly why until the very, very, very end, but he's really like, you, he's got to get her to care about the world so that he can live through her, basically. Um, and one way to make that story interesting is to make his obstacle really hard. So she is prickly, she is angry, she is resistant, she is sarcastic, um, <laughs> all the things that, you know, if he came in and was like, hey, I care about things. And she was like, me too, end of play. <laughs> so she has to, to not, and it truly is a play about her transformation because of this young man's perseverance and creativity and vulnerability and, um, and resilience, resilience himself. Wonderful, wonderful. We have a question from Layla Cook. Layla, can you unmute and show us your video and ask your question? Hi, um, I love the play. I thought it was amazing. It's so good um, and great job to the actors. My question was, um, I really like the balance that you had between the dramatics and the also bits of like lighthearted comedy. Um, when you're writing your plays, how do you find that perfect balance of both and um is that something that you spend a lot of time on during the writing process what a great question i mean the truth is that you know there's always laughter at a funeral and crying at a wedding and you know life itself is a blend of funny and terrifying and sorrowful and delightful and so i think a play um a play needn't be just serious or just funny um, so this, certainly this play with these dark themes, having this um, levity and I mean, the, the truth about comedy, I think the best comedy is that the characters in the play do not know they're in a comedy. They think it's very serious and everything's very important. <laughs> um, but we get to laugh because of the high stakes for them and the pressure put on them and their machinations to, you know, do, do what they need to do. So in that way, it... Um, there is a natural blend of, of those things. And I think what you see, certainly in, in my writing, I tend to have um, peaks um, of energy and peaks of emotion that kind of drop into some sort of revelation, drop into some sort of admission or confession. So you have people get really mad and then they go, I'm adopted or whatever it is. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then out of that, that moment of, of vulnerability and openness, the rest of the play moves forward. But that usually happens because of a fight or because of a joke. Um, so there's lots of things kind of crashing into each other. And I just particularly enjoy it as an audience member. So the, the truth to a lot of my writing is I'm writing plays that I want to see. <laughs> um, Thank you. They still make me laugh. So. <laughs> Wonderful. I just want to go ahead and um, 
let everyone know out there, uh, many of our audience have tuned in, that we can take your questions via the, Q the chat function. Um, if you want to open up uh, and ask questions or, or comment about the performance, you're welcome to put that in uh, to the chat and uh, I'll be calling on you as well. Uh, so our next question, uh, Lily, would you ask your question? Hi, uh, I really liked that. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I was just curious, um, before your career took off in like writing, um, do you have, do you remember like a core experience regarding your artistic career? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I knew I wanted to write pretty young and I was in early high school, late middle school. And I thought I made the connection between, oh, I really love theater. And I thought I wanted to be an actor because I think a lot of people, that's their entryway in theater whether it's like school plays or <laughs> pageants or things. Um, and then I kind of realized, oh, but the writer gets to decide what happens. <laughs> I like that amount of power. <laughs> and truthfully, I, as an actor, looked around and I didn't see a lot of roles for girls. And I was like, oh, somebody should write them. Maybe I should, I guess I'll write them. <laughs> so it really did start with looking around and quite selfishly thinking, there's no good roles for ladies if you're not old enough to play Juliet and you're too old for Scout or Annie or <laughs> like, what are, what is there? Um, so looking at that, what is a, a dearth and, and offering my experience. And also, you know, it continues today with looking around and thinking, I remember as a, a, young, a younger writer, knowing I needed to read a lot, looking around and saying, well, there's roles for like one or two women in a lot of plays, but not like all women or mostly women. And my life is a lot of women. Like, why, is, why does theater not look like the life I know? Um, so any of you out there that look out and see like, oh, I've never seen a play that looks like me. Please write it. Please, please, please. We can't wait. We need it. Um, yes. But I, I also remember several times seeing fabulous productions. Uh, some, uh, some ones that stick out are Shakespeare's on Broadway, you know, and but really seeing things and just thought that it moved me so much. It surprised me so much. Um, I thought, well, I want to play in that, in that um, sandbox, you know, <laughs> like I want to use those tools. I want to see what I can make with those tools. So every play I saw was an inspiration to the next one that I was dreaming up. And I will also warn you all, my children may stampede in here at any moment. So. Oh, good. Fair warning. <laughs> We'd love to see them. Um, and so Carly, would you like to come on up and ask the question? Hi. So, um, Poetry obviously plays a very big part in the show, which I think is really cool because I love to read poetry and probably everyone else does too. Um, and my question was, because there are obviously a lot of poems written about life and death. So what specifically drew you to Walt Whitman and his ideas of life and deathlessness? Um, Walt Whitman was taught in my high school, and I remember responding to that, his poetry, um, very much. Hold on one second. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, <laughs> managing children in the background. Um, and yeah, and so the, the poetry meant a lot to me and I thought it would be something that would be, that would mean a lot to others and especially in this age group. Um, so you kind of like, are you gonna do, you know, Emily Dickinson or Robert Frost or Walt Whitman <laughs> or maybe Maya Angelou, but um, uh, Walt Whitman felt kind of epic and odd. It's one of those classics that if you read it is bizarre and just so huge and rule breaking and, you know, not the orderly poet you might expect to be taught to every American student. Um, and so it felt like a natural place to combine the themes of the play, which is freedom and body and um, joy. Uh, and, you know, he was writing during the Civil War. So the combination of joy and crisis, which is very what these kids are going through too. So it felt like it hit on a lot of levels and it's just beautiful, such beautiful poetry and poetry that I think begs to be read out loud. So every time they quote the, the poems in the play, it just makes me so happy. <laughs> when women were all locked up in their clothes. <laughs> That's a great. <laughs> so I'm gonna take a question uh, 
from the Q and A. Uh, and this question is actually for for the uh, producers and act and the actors. Amy asks a question for all of us regarding the particular process and how we found ourselves trying to produce theater during the pandemic. Um, what was the biggest hurdle in putting the show together and getting it to the audience? And what have we learned about um, ourselves or our process, be it as the writer, director, or actor? Um, so that will affect us as we continue working in theater. So uh, Nick and Olivia, if you guys are there, do you guys want to respond to what it was like to work in this environment? The biggest um, yeah. <laughs> I let the record show that Olivia looked at me and said, go ahead. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> no, but, um, but it, it's definitely a very bizarre thing to transfer something as um, both uh, minuscule as a, being a theater, uh, being a theater actor is like you focus on the very, the small stuff, but then also it's about the broad picture. And in a lot of ways um, with the cameras and with uh, just the different atmosphere, you find yourself having to um, maintain a different sort of centered balance uh, as an individual in this different environment because you're missing an energy that isn't there which is the audience but so what really matters is that the energy between yourself and your partner and the other people in the room is three times as strong and as um just i guess giving in a lot of ways uh, and everyone on this project has been so incredibly thoughtful and precise and just the most generous, uh, loving people I've ever had the privilege of getting to spend time with. Um, and if it wasn't for that, this would be a very, very difficult and oftentimes even terrifying experience. Um, but I'm not afraid of the camera anymore. <laughs> so, uh, and now I can't wait to see what I look like. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, similarly, um, that was definitely one of the biggest challenges uh, as actors was um, it, it's been a while since I've done a theater play. I've been filmed for a little bubble for the past couple years. So at first I was like, wait, am I doing, I was trying to think, I was like, am I doing something for film or am I doing something for theater? Because it's such a different uh, medium and, and the way you act is very, very different. So it's been really challenging and fun to find places where we can keep things small and uh, for film or places where we keep things really huge for theater. And another uh, constraint is the size of this room. This is my room. Um, <laughs> I, um, my childhood home. Um, and so we are using this very small space um, using a ton of the stuff that I already owned, but it's the smallest playing space I've worked in. <laughs> and also uh, it was so daunting to do a two person play to me. Like I, that's, that's a big scary thing to do when you look at it before you start working on it. But I feel like we found a, a way to make it accessible to us. And we worked so hard <laughs> between rehearsals to make sure that was not something we were worrying about, you know, staying on top of all of the lines and energy because, you know, there's so many other things we're dealing with that we're not used to. So, yeah. Well done. Well done. Uh, Chris Marshall has a question uh, for Lauren. Was the storyline or log line conceived first to include the themes of Whitman and jazz or vice versa? Um, yeah, the storyline was first and then Whitman and Jazz were threaded into it. The weird thing, though, is that Whitman is so perfect. I mean, I even thought like, OK, it's the liver and it's the this and that. And then the idea of getting to the end of of um, I mean, quite frankly, I was using the beginning of Leaves of Grass, like trying to get the thing, the draft. Does this work? Is it even going to work? Can I pull this off? 
and then getting to the end of, of the poem, rereading it and, and really reading it with I and you in mind and going like, oh my God, this is a puzzle piece that like fits and is perfect. <laughs> so it's a little spooky, little connection Mr. Whitman and I had. I think he was like, hey, Lauren, got a poem, use it. <laughs> um, I'm so glad you did. It's a very meaningful, um, the themes in this, uh, I, it's just rife. I've read it and read it and read it and just appreciate it so much. Tony, Tony Keen has a question. Tony, you want to come on video? Yes. Hi. Um, I'm a huge fan and it's really a great honor to meet you. I asked for your plays for my 17th birthday and I got them. So that's kind of cool. Um, and so this was kind of a gift too, to be able to do this. So thank you, Amelia. And thank you, Lauren. Um, so with Silent Sky and Ada and the Machine came the representation of women in STEM. And of course, the Book of Will is about Shakespeare. And in I and You, the whole play revolves around this project that they're doing. And in your opinion, Lauren, um, what is the importance of blending theater and education? Mm, oh, great question. Um, so it's so nice to meet you. And um, we should get those plays signed for you or something, but not just the play. So we'll work on that later. Um, anyway. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think every play, like humans are creative species and curious species and the whole, <laughs> this is gonna sound very grand, but I think about theater not just as an entertainment or kind of a, a triviality um, or even art. It is a thought experiment. And the reason we came up with story, live storytelling at all is to play out a thought experiment so that we can become better, smarter, wiser creatures. Um, because we are highly social creatures, so we pay attention to each other. So the, all the plays are saying, hey, look at those people, and people are the most interesting thing to other people. Um, so when every play should be educational, because it is teaching you about how to be resilient, how to survive, how to know if someone's lying, how to fall in love, how to know if love is real, <laughs> um, as well as astronomy and computer design and Walt Whitman and um, John Coltrane. So I think every opportunity um, to educate is also an opportunity to engage and to enliven and um, to also connect fiction to fact and truth um, to uh, the stories that we, we make out of truth. So the idea of fictional characters talking about a real poet or a real musician or a real disease helps us go, oh, the lesson, like fiction is real. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, some part of fiction is, is real. Um, and it's also, I, the, the history plays, Book of Will and Silent Sky and such. I love those because I love period dramas. I love history. And I think theater has this really unique ability to time travel. Like it feels so present, um, these history plays and in the way that theater is just so alive um, in front of you and you're usually <laughs> in real space and time um, with people. So, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Kayleen has a question. Kayleen? Uh, I love the play. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Um, so during this pandemic, um, I and others like in the area have experienced sort of like a change in our creative processes. And I just wanted to know, how has your creative process changed during this unprecedented event? <laughs> so Kayleen, who is that question for? Um, I'm guessing it would be for Lauren and everybody who worked on it, just because like we, I think, like, like I said, everybody has gone through sort of a change when nothing is um, certain, you know what I mean? C certainly, so actors, do you wanna respond? Um, you first. Yes, <laughs> yes. It, it was so different, like I said earlier, um, in process, but then also it was the first time both of us you, you, you too, right? Have mounted a two-person play. Yeah, right? No. no? I don't know anything about him. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyway, um, it, we had to add in some extra processes to be able to uh, work on it in this new um, medium. And so our wonderful production team set up a virtual green room for us where we were able to run lines every day for hours um, without having to uh, come into the space, you know, and um, 
Yeah, and the, the process was just majorly different because of the intense COVID protocols as well that we followed. Um, and that's another thing to thank our production team at, and Amelia for. It was pristine, and I feel like um, that part of the process was really great. <laughs> Go ahead, Nick. Oh, just I, I, in terms of like acting and in terms of the actual process, uh, that didn't change so much um, in terms of how to approach the material, in terms of how to develop the process in that way. Um, but without the live audience and without the experience to be able to test the show in front of an audience, like with like a preview period, or so, even if it's just one or two performances in front of someone, can tell you so much about what you what you're doing and how it's being perceived. Um, so really a lot of this was just, uh, for me personally, having to sit back and become confident in the choices I was making and accepting the fact that I'm gonna make this choice. I don't know how it's going to be perceived. I won't get to see the response and I need to stop worrying so much about the audience. I need to just, this, I need to be confident in the choices that I'm making um, because that's all that's really, that's all I can control in this situation, I only get one chance at it. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Sid, would you like to come on and ask your question? Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I first off, I love this show. I, I've read it before, but like it was really interesting seeing it done in a Zoom format. Like the ending really struck a chord with me. Like that hit me really hard. Um, but my question is uh, for Lauren and uh, I, I was wondering, um, so I enjoy a lot of your plays and the scenes I find very engaging and uh, there isn't one part that turns me away. So I was wondering, like, you know, we all face writer's block, no matter like our form of art through acting, we all, we all face some sort of block in our art. What, do you, what are your strategies uh, to get over that? Sure, um, hi, nice to meet you. Um, I honestly refuse to believe in writer's block um, because the truth is you can write anything. It doesn't have to be good. <laughs> you can just keep writing, journal, just free write. If you're stuck on something, um, write around it, write, uh, you know, write way before that scene would come or way after. You know, so there's a lot of ways to not let it define you. And I think if you believe in writer's block, then it's a thing. And if not, you can say like, no, yeah, I'm just gonna write something else. Um, but technically, um, usually if you write yourself into a corner, it's because of something you did on the very first. Sorry. Okay, one second, sorry. Um, hold on, buddy, will you wait? What's wrong, baby? Why don't you come sit with me? Just come sit with me, sweetie. <laughs> um, he's been a little sick, so we're we're oh. we're nursing. I will, honey, and just. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, hi, this is Asa. Hi, Asa. You've seen some plays, haven't you, buddy? Do you like plays? He's deciding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, you want to, oh, you can stay if you want, Nancy, if you just be a little quiet. Thanks. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think that like technical, if you find yourself in a writer's block place, either write something else or start, look way back in the beginning of the play for the rules that you invented and set up and be like, do I need these rules? Is that why they, he can't get out of the room because I didn't give him hands. You know what I mean? Like, well, give him hands. You're making it up. <laughs> Fix it. So, you know, there's lots of ways to to challenge yourself um, to figure out like, how do I untangle this? Oftentimes it's making something simpler. Um, and if you're focusing too much on plot, the real thing that real thing that we're there for is character and emotion. So write the stuff that is full of, full of the feels. <laughs> so I, in, in the interest of your time, um, I, I want to ask you about, well, I'm going to ask a question then two more questions after that. Um, Mimi Rice had asked a question in the chat, and I understand that you have a play coming out in January. Would you share that with everyone? 
Sure. Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, so this is a play I never thought I would write, although it's also been 10 years in the making. So it's about my husband, Nathan Wolf, who is a um, virologist who studies pandemics. And so that has been an interesting bedfellow in the last couple months. And um, so the play is about, is about him, is about his father, his science. Um, uh, it's actually not about COVID. It's not about him right now. It's about him just a few years earlier. So of course, pandemics are all over it in the way that we've come to know them, but it's really about Kind of zooming in on the, the heart and soul of the scientist at the at the heart of this thing we all know too well. Um, so I'm very proud of it. It's a one person show, which is even harder than a two person show. So <laughs> get ready, <laughs> Olivia. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's I'm really proud of it. We just started rehearsals. We're going to our COVID protocol is because it's one person show. Convenient, no kissing, no no anything else that would get you in trouble in a pandemic. Um, but we're going to film it on stage. So it's fully designed, set much like yours, um, costume designed, everything. But we're going to film it kind of like a movie. So it'll be hopefully closer to those kind of national theater productions. Um, but somewhere in the middle of what is a live play, what is a film, what is the way that we can enjoy both. That's wonderful. Yes, with a two-person play during COVID, we had complete quarantine for our actors. So <laughs> in order to pull this off, we have time for just two more questions. Uh, we have uh, Simone, would you like to come on video? Do we have you, Simone? Oh, sorry, I didn't unmute. Um, I recently also read your play, Silent Sky, so my question is kind of correlating to that with, I know a lot of your work has based off like historical significance. And I was wondering what your process behind like researching these historical events and these people and like bringing these nonfiction people to life in your plays and like your process behind that. Um, oh, I love writing about history so much. Um, in some cases, it is already written for you, like a lot of the plot and a lot of the, the kind of interesting moments that are just absolutely iconic and fascinating. And so that's, people just love it. So it's, it's about World War II, it's about the Civil War, it's about Queen Elizabeth, it's you know about this famous discovery. So there's a draw. Um, and my job is to really figure out, well, what's the humanity and the emotion around this fact, this discovery, this history? And that's the fun part, right? What is, you know, very famous, powerful people get their hearts broken and get there. Now we have a second guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you ding dong. Get out of here, you ding dong. Um, <laughs> so I think history is, is so fascinating and theater is really great for it um, because we get to zoom in on the people making this critical decision. So the big, big, my job is to figure out what part of history can't tell it all. And it's not just a series of facts and, and events. So how do you zoom in on the moment of discovery, the moment of decision, the moment of heartbreak? Um, and that's, that's, and then build scenes around that and earning that. So, but I love it very much. And um I'll always write a history in a science play, sometimes both at the same time. That's wonderful. So we have one last question. Um, I know we have a lot of questions for you, so, uh, but we can only take time for one more. <laughs> uh, Rescue Can has asked a question in the chat. Um, he says, Lauren, you have written so successfully on a variety of topics. How many projects or ideas roll around in your head at one time? And what is the germination time? Thank you. Um, ooh, a lot of plays, um, but usually ones at different phases of development. So one that's brand new that I don't even know quite if it's going to work yet, all the way to the one where I'm just copy editing, editing to make sure the commas are in the right places. Um, and the truth is that this, the scary thing for, for writers that I, I teach or, or mentor is that the writing actually begins once you've already done the first draft, because that's where you can actually do the work to see if it's real. And so the first day of rehearsal on a reading of the brand new play, the first time you hear it out loud, gotten all the way to the end, that's actually when the work starts, because it's then that you go, is this a play? How does this become the best at the, something that an actor would just kill to do this part? And our lighting designer is like, oh, it's gonna be fun. Um, how do you make it hit all of the things that theater is really, is really good at? Um, so yes, I have a lot. Um, and also some are very different. Like some are just hit dramas and then you got a farce and then you've got a kid's musical and you know, one person play about your husband. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, but they take about a year-ish, unless I, I'm pressured. The, the, the husband play was quicker um, because 
Yeah. Cause it felt like, well, if you're going to write it, probably should write it now. <laughs> um, and he actually heard it for the very first time a couple of days ago, which was pretty wild for both of us. <laughs> um, but yes. So about a year. Almost. Lauren, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> and thank you, Asa, for joining us. <laughs> and um, actors, do you have any last words that you'd like to say? Um, well, this is, you know, cheesy, but thanks for writing this play. <laughs> it's been, it's been the best thing I've worked on so far. And I, you write dialogue so well, you write teenagers so well, you write illness so well. And I really appreciate that. It was in a lot of ways, quite cathartic to be able to. Well, that means so I a lot. Great deal. <laughs> yes. Nicholas? No, I, I just, I, thank you. I, I, I read this play when it was the first edition uh, before um, everything. I, I, had, I had a ticket to the original production, the off-Broadway production. No way! Um, when I went to audition for colleges and then the New York blizzard happened. That's right. And That's right. I, the one performance that was canceled was the one that I had a ticket to. Oh, um, but I'm glad I, I didn't see it because uh, then this wouldn't have felt the same. Mm. So this was, I, I, I've never fate. seen a production of this show and it was fate. And this has been a beautiful experience. And thank you for um, being such a great contributor to Tampa Rep in a way that uh, Silent Sky was such a beautiful production that we did four years ago. And uh, I and you is continuing our relationship with your wonderful writing. So thank yeah. you. Well, that means a lot too. And I, I'm so grateful to be doing theater right now. It's so important. I'm so impressed with this production and the way that we can be together when we can't be together. So thank you for doing the good work. And um, thank you for allowing my sons to take over. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful to have him here. Uh, so thank you, Lauren. And I just want to take a moment to thank the fantastic production team without whom this would not have been possible with the four cameras and all of those things and our, our wonderful stage manager who uh, calling all of these camera angles, which is not the typical theater stage manager job. <laughs> and a special thank you to Hal Friedman and Willie Radowski, who are our show sponsors and all the many donors um, individual donors who continue to help Tampa Rep um, to Chris and Bridget Hart for providing housing for Nick to be able to quarantine so that we could be in the same room. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. And please tell your friends that through the end of Wednesday, November 25th, you can still uh, stream on Broadway On Demand, I and You by Lauren Gunderson, the Tampa Rep production. Thank you all. Have a wonderful Thanks, day. everybody. Stay safe. Wear masks. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>